Timber Talks is brought to you by Wood Solutions. Stay up to date with the latest in timber, the building material that is strong, safe and sustainable. Here is your host, Adam Jones. This is going to be part two of a two-part discussion with the design team for 55 South Bank Boulevard, which is a new defining landmark in Melbourne, a 10-storey CLT building that is going to be sitting on top of an existing seven-storey concrete building. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, I suggest that you go back and listen to that first before moving on to this episode. So in this episode, we're going to sit down with Julian Anderson, who is a director at Bait Smart, Nathan Benbow, who is an engineer at VizTech, and Rob DeBrincat, who is the builder at Atelier Projects. And here we're going to discuss all about the building information modeling and the utilization of these models for fabrication and construction and the importance of collaborating with the shop drawers and installers just to ensure that you're going to have successful prefabrication. And also, all of the key lessons learned that they're all going to take on to their future projects. So this was a really great discussion. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. And without any further ado, we'll get into the interview. So guys, what was the role of building information modelling in uh, solving a lot of the design issues really up front for the project? Oh, look, I think, um, I mean, we've, at, at Bait Smart, we have, I think, about 90% of our projects post-town planning application use Revit. Um, so we're pretty familiar with the, 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 the world of BIM. Um, I, I think it was key in this, in this cross, uh, process, but to be honest, it, it's something we do on every project. And I'd say sort of generally that what's happened ha- is... Um, there's so much more detailed coordination occurring up front in the design process and it's just done as a matter of course. It means that there should be, subject to the quality of documentation of course, there should be less issues on site, there should be less surprises, certainly fewer major surprises on site. Um, it's probably best if Rob talks about how quickly the information that we provided at Bates at the end of documentation was then was then transferred into um, into panel panel shop drawings. Yeah, look, I think I po- probably think that's one of the areas that 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 um, we we need to work on in a bit more detail. Um, and it's 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 really about that education process and understanding what we need in the model, and having that discussion very very early um, and. The level of detailing was a little bit more complicated as we, we reduced the walls as we went up. Um, and it's about having the, the there's a bit of a, a, a misconception out there at the moment or um, a thought from a from a, a modeling perspective whether or not models can be used for shop drawings. And and it, look, yeah. I'll, I'll comment on it and, and then allow Julian to sort of speak yeah. as well as Nathan. Um, because there's a feel, there's a feeling out there by architects that yes, we've got a model, but you can't, you can't rely on it for shop drawings, and um, and it, it, it's a little bit difficult from a builder's perspective because we need to use something to build the sh- the shop drawings as, and, and start manufacturing. And I think it's more around just everyone being on the same page early on about that. And because of these jobs being um, you know, the first of their kind, really at this scale. Um, it's 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 only really the, the first time that the consultants are really and builders and suppliers are starting to have these discussions and and it's around understanding what what we need or what the suppliers need from an information perspective to complete their shop drawings and the coordination with services and those sort of details that it's not it's not that we 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 don't need a lot of the information that's actually in the BIM model to create the CLT model. So, um, so I think that's a really important part. Um, but look, for, for this project, it was the fact that it was a hotel really simplified that process because, you know, we, we looked at the doorways above. I think we had three different types of service doorway openings for the whole job, and it was really identifying unit number so and so, so and so, so and so on. Each level is type A, and the rest are type B, and one over there is a type C, and that's really simple. Um, and, and the same worked in, in a lot of those details. So it was quite simple to, to bridge the gaps when they existed. Um, 
But I'd, I'd be interested to hear from a consultant's perspective where where everyone's starting or where Bait Smart sit now yeah. relative to that experience and and what your thoughts are relative to using this model as 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 the base for shop drawings. Well, it is it is as you say. I mean, this is a relatively um, new issue for us. You know, I think we've been grappling with it over the last sort of five to six years as 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 the um, as Revit has emerged as the, the number one tool for documentation. And I think that the challenge we have at the moment actually is that we are, you know, we're delivering two dimensional um, set of documents as PDFs and, and, um, and hard copy with dimensions on them describing set outs. And we don't actually document every single aspect of the building when, you, when we issue it. Some of that work is done in, in two dimensions, including adding, adding, adding dimensions to the drawing. So the issue we have, I think, I think we're sort of caught in a position. We are now, all of our clients are asking for our 3D models at the end of the documentation process. And we're saying, well, yes, you can have them, but don't use them to build this building, which is... Look, I acknowledge it's a little bit odd mm. because we've invested all of this time. Everyone, Nathan and his team, everyone's invested all of this time into these models. And then we're saying, well, actually, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're fantastic. They're great models. And there's thousands of hours of work in them, but you can't use them or you have to reconstruct them. But essentially, it comes down to the fact that um, I, I, I think we can't really take responsibility for the fabrication process. Um, and I think we're also then constrained or, or, or in a way, I guess we're supported by the fact that, it's, that, that these projects are design and construct contracts. So you say, this is, here's our construction drawings. It's a 2D set of information. You can build using the dimensions on it. If you want the 3D model, it's a useful tool. But some of that responsibility of design needs to go to the fabricators. Um, so I think it's, it's an issue that we need to continue to discuss. I don't know how we resolve it, to be honest, um, but it's something we need to keep talking about. And ideally, Rob, I think what, what needs to happen is there needs to be a... Um, I mean, maybe it's via this ECI process. I suspect that's probably where we break the back of this issue. Yeah, and, and look, I think it's something that's... It's, it's a really interesting discussion and, and things we need to continue to have because it, it is inefficient at the moment. There's a lot of resource going into it and, and I'm sure when Nathan gets the opportunity to talk, it, he's done a lot of modelling himself um, on this project and others. Um, and look, I think, I think it's, it, it, it's a lot of the liability issue has stemmed from past experiences. In these types of jobs, there needs to be a high level of collaboration. And, you know, a good builder in this space can't just be a project manager and a, a, a postman and not reading documents via an Aconex communication stream. They have to be really getting involved in the detail, understanding the detail and taking responsibility for the detail. And I think when the consultants start feeling that, that they're not in, you know, they're, they're not in the crosshairs. <laughs> that that this is a team, this is a collaboration. Um, at the end of the day, we need shop drawings to manufacture something, a ten-story structure within one millimetre. Um, let's work together to achieve that. And 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 the ECI is a really good way of doing that. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. I don't have an answer. I don't think anyone has an answer to the whole responsibility and uh, the risk that's associated with the BIM aspect of of the design but um, I think at the moment we should just I mean BIM is a pretty broad sort of uh, term essentially for what we're talking about but aside from the information part which I think has to come at a late, later date uh, when we look at the whole the whole uh, supply chain and uh, through to construction of the building and looking at things like um, carbon offsets and all of that side of things. Let's start with the, the physical aspects of the building, which are important to actually building it. So I, I tend to focus more on the actual model as a, a geometric solution rather than the information that you can associate with that. But from that perspective, I think it's, yeah, it's crucial to have a model for this type of project. And um, I've certainly invested a lot of time to work closely with uh, KLH to do their shop drawings and review, um, you know, model after model and um, revision after revision to get things right and coordinate that with my own 
uh, connection detailing to ensure we've got rebates and notches where required, that things are actually going to go together through to sequencing of panels for look, working with Atelier to actually, you know, determine how this project's going to be built and therefore, you know, what lap, half lap has to go where. Um, from that perspective through to the pods um, that's a big one with services because we've got these bathroom pods that need to be installed and um, have services coming up that panels have to literally sleeve over the top of and uh, go together like a jigsaw puzzle um, it's yeah very important to have a proper model yeah and I think it's it's good point that Nathan makes is that the level of layers that we do within this shop drawing process it's not just drawing the elements it's it's looking about constructability and the connections and sequencing and containerization what order they come in these are big panels so you can't be sorting them out you really want them in the order that you want um, but I think another point too um, is is that the a 3d model architecturally has a lot of information yeah, on it yeah. and, and we we as as you look at a CLT building that the core the key part of this is to make sure that the, the structure is in the right location it's the right thickness and the wall starts and ends at the same the right place the edge of the buildings in the right place and that's the perfect starting point and I think that if if there's there's understanding of that early on in the process for an ACI um, when the model is, is being created um, that we're working with this supplier of this thickness and really the rest of it we can sort out we can run on 2d might look it'd be good if it was all incorporated but especially in this hotel style development you know get some details about all the services where exactly what does the gpa look like where are the locations of the gpa it doesn't have to be in the model yeah. so the risk profile significantly drops because the two-dimensional drawings and dimensions should show where the building is anyway so it's not really a, a, a big step to take it take to the next level in the model to say well, let's just draw don't worry about where the panels end and start where are where is the structure coordinated with the structural engineer thicknesses and locations in space and that's the perfect starting point. well I think I think that's interesting because I think that means going back to your earlier point about having um, contractors that aren't just post boxes I think because traditionally the consultant team Nathan and, and, and our team and WSP will will operate in isolation for so long um, in, a, in a model space that is is therefore sort of not socialised with head contractor and, and fabricators, I think there's an opportunity probably to just spend a little bit more time together, either at the end or during the process, to just establish actually what, what do you need from us? Because we think, we've done a lot of projects, we think we know what you need. Most of the time I think we do, but we're, we're constrained from often having that dialogue with you about what's the actual final output required. I think just going back to the time issue as well, we are at the moment continuing to document in our Revit model the complicated geometry associated with our aluminium um, opening that surrounds our balcony on level seven on the uh, fa fronting the, the gym area. So this is a, a complicated piece of um, aluminium fabrication and um, we're working with the facade contractor on, on that piece. And that's a piece that has, has gone through a huge amount of um, effort at, at Bates Smart. And we're continuing to work on it, you know, even after um, completing our construction documentation over 12 months ago. So I think in certain instances where we understand and Rob and his team understand that Batesmart are the only ones that can really deliver the complex geometry associated with certain aspects of the projects, of which this is, this is a perfect example, then we can work together to essentially give you the model from which this fabricator, the, um, the, the, the facade um, fabricator is going to fabricate this piece. So I think there's the gap there um, has certainly been reduced in comparison to you know many other projects we've done. So we're getting better at understanding what quantum of information yeah, we need to provide. I think, I think it's really important to say what what do we actually need. It's a, and, and I said before, there's a lot of waste in in, in a lot of the design process because a lot of effort, a lot of hours is going into a model, and is it actually being used? So I think. Any type of innovative construction, and, and we're talking about mass timber here, which is which is probably leading the charge, is is an opportunity there to to flesh that out and have that discussion and go, what do we actually need, 
and you, we don't need that other stuff. So, so there's no real need of unless someone else does. But you know, let's talk about that. Let's make it more efficient. Let's cut the fat off this process to make it extremely more efficient um, and and yeah, generate the the information in the model that we actually require. Well, I think it's important to discuss what everyone thinks they need because I, I know from experience that people don't actually know what they need as well, which is important because we need to have that meeting up front to actually say, well, we can produce this for you and it's important to have because, yeah, like you say, is it wasted time to build a model and then the installers or fabricators go, ah, I don't need that, I know what I'm doing, and then they're not utilising those design elements that will make the project so much more efficient and it, it have it's happened on previous jobs yeah. that nathan and i have worked on that you know a lot of efforts gone in at the front end on a model uh, looking at sort of steel connections and then the fabricator just makes their own decision that they'll do it another way and they think it's efficient um but they haven't really thought about all the details that nathan and i have spoken about at length this is the reason why we're doing this connection and um, it's about communication, it's about collaboration all the way down the line. And I, I talk regularly around ECIs and the efficiencies of ECIs and, and trying to streamline that process from the client all the way down to subcontractors and how important that is. And I really think you know, any talk, form of innovative construction like CLT gives us the opportunity to have that discussion. I actually think, yeah, I mean, this is diverting slightly, but I think what we're finding in DNC is that the client has expectations around level of detail that they're going to get in, in order to get greater cost certainty but that requires us to do more work in isolation of, of the contractors um, and we're forming an opinion at Bates Smart that actually in you know in many cases ECI knowing knowing the builder and you know the relationships and the quality of the work that's that's going to be produced is is, is going to be a better outcome so I think DNC has been the sort of predominant method of procurement for at least the last 20 years but we're starting to feel like actually with the relationships we've built up within the building industry it's better to actually just go go ECI and work together to get the project done in the manner that suits everyone. Yeah there's another point I wanted to make to just sort of backtracking a little bit relative to the model and Julian's comments about two-dimensional drawings so we're dealing with that internally we've got um, other mass timber projects where um, we've got a model, we've, we've developed it, a lot of time and resources going into it, it's extremely accurate, it's coordinated with structural steel and services and the guys on site are demanding two-dimensional drawings laminated <laughs> because that's what they're used to and that's what they want to do and, and, and they're not comfortable with a, an iPad or a laptop looking at the model and controlling the model. So it filters all the way through to one side as well and, and we need to really capitalise on the opportunity of this technology. And it's not complicated. Yes, it's complicated to build, but there's so many really simple viewers out there that, that the construction people, um, the people actually building it, can can manoeuvre and look at and understand. But there's this mindset that I need two-dimensional drawings. It's what we've always done, and it's the only way I know how to do it. So I think that needs to be broken as well. And we're doing everything we can to do that and um, at Atelier with our delivery team. So I think, I think it's a function of experience, but it needs to transfer all the way from the start of the model through the construction as well. Yeah, well, it's certainly happening on this project. I'm working very closely with Atalia and uh, the installers with my model that has connection. It doesn't have every connection detail in it, but it's got the critical ones and the complex ones that I'll sit down with them, run through that, and they c and teach them essentially how to use that model. and how to interpret that information so they can use that in conjunction with the 2D drawings. And Rob, what is the program you're looking to build with once the timber construction starts at the upper levels? Um, yeah, so the program's a really good question um, and, and it probably goes into another uh, topic of discussion just away from timing, but the, everyone sees CLT as a very, very fast structural installation or construction process, which it is. However, um, even, even around the world, you still see examples of structures going up without the follow-on trades. And what's really unique about um, the way we're going to approach the South Bank job is that a lot of items are going to sit on critical path. So we're really going to focus on making sure that when we finish a cycle per level, um, that's not only structure, we're also going to have bathroom pods installed. We're also going to have pre-packed cottage lots. So a cottage lot is 
basically finished materials that, that are packed in a certain size and lifted up on critical path as well. And then at a certain stage of that, we're going to start wrapping the building with the facade. So look, it, it's, it's not an easy question to answer because it's, it, it is cake tiered and we are staggering. Um, but we're looking, I believe at the moment, we're looking at about a 10 day per level, which is very similar to a concrete structure. But at the end of those 10 days or each level cycle, we'll have all that um, construction work completed. So even though CLT is a very, very fast structural solution, um, you really need to capitalise on that by getting trades following on as quickly as you can behind to make sure your entire construction program is reduced. And look, we, we've we probably spent a bit of extra time, more than we were hoping, to strengthen the building and, and, um, and to get the transfer deck completed. So we've had some challenges with that, but we're really confident we'll be able to catch that up with the when the CLT starts going up. And Rob, can you talk a little bit about the logistics process of taking the panels all the way from Europe through to construction of the building? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it probably opens up a discussion around uh, mass timber supply. Um, I mentioned Exlam before. I used to I used to work at Exlam. Exlam, um, the the only manufacturers in. Or oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. There's a few others popping up, but the biggest manufacturer CLT um, in in the southern hemisphere in Australia with factories in in Australia and as well as New Zealand. And um, we we had to opt with a European supplier on this project. The, their factory wasn't really um, going to be ready in time for the supply. Um, so we're opted to get it out of Europe and we've got good relationships with uh, numerous suppliers out of, out of Europe as well as, as, well as Exelam locally. Um, so we opted with a, with a KLH supplier. So KLH supplied the Forte building, um, one of the original manufacturers of CLT. And it's a really interesting discussion around uh, the, the efficiencies and or inefficiencies of, of local supply versus international supply. Um, and and it, it's very much focused around, um, there's other elements, but mainly logistics. So this, this project um, is, in, is manufactured in, in Austria, trucked down to Italy, and then shipped directly to, um, to Melbourne. Um, some is, is transshipment via Asia. And they come in various containers. So you've got a standing container as well as an open top out of gauge container. Um, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for a job of this magnitude to deliver in sequence and to interport, clear it and deliver it to site, ready for install. Um, and then the access on site needs to be understood. Um, can you even take a container to site? Um, can you unload the container on site? Um, how do you safely hook up the panel? All of these things need to be really discussed. And the answer is for South Bank, no, you can't. So they'll be going to a, a separate facility um, and like any builder you want to manage your risks so the panels are coming a bit early than we need them to make sure they're here so there's some storage costs required as well um, we've done a lot of work in in understanding the handling process to make sure we're not double triple quadruple handling the panels because they are big um, so we, we've done it we've done a lot of work on that um, so they'll, the panels will arrive they'll be uh, de-stuffed or removed from different containers stored and then delivered to site on trucks. We will be doing some elements of prefabrication in a factory to the, to the panels. There's certain um, fire collars and whatnot that need to be pre-installed around the bathroom pods. So we'll be, we'll be utilising our contractors to do that. Um, and then they'll be delivered to site on, on standard either A-frames for walls or, or standard flatbed trucks with the necessary um, fall climbing equipment needed for safety requirements to lift the panels up but um, when you compare that model to a locally manufactured um, you are eliminating the, the the importation component and companies like XLAM can take a panel straight from the from the end of the CNC and, and load it onto the back of a truck and, and send it um, as, as required or just in time. So there's definitely benefits with, with that approach from a logistics perspective. And Julian, it's the first significant building extension using CLT. What do you think is the feasibility of similar projects going forward? Look, I think, um, I think what's happening in, in Melbourne, particularly in the CBD and South Bank, is that there are some very quite onerous planning controls in place which are limiting uh, the development potential of sites. And that's, that's something that's emerged 
um, with the introduction of the current planning controls and that they were introduced about 18 months ago. So we've seen probably only four or five planning applications in the last 12 months under the um, under those current planning controls. So I think what's hap what will happen, we'll see developers and owners of property um, looking at, you know, taking another look at their sites and rather than potentially demolishing their sites, they might be looking at expanding them through um, the introduction of new levels and obviously timber timber might be the um, the solution in many cases because of the fact that it's 20 percent lighter lighter than concrete and I I attended a conference recently and 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 someone mentioned it was quite an interesting fact I thought that 90 percent of the buildings in New York which we imagine as being one of the taller cities on the planet are actually 14 stories or less and I suspect that number is probably tran tran translatable to to Melbourne. So I think what we'll see is, you know, as more of these projects are built and and the the intellectual property is shared more widely across the construction industry, I, I really think we will see a lot more of these sorts of projects in um, in central Melbourne, which is where where Batesmart tends to operate. But I think also we'll see um, more use of of timber in you know, business parks and the periphery of Melbourne in, in places where it is pretty easy to get access in and out and, 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 and you, you can really take advantage of the, um, the, the time benefits of, of using this material. Yeah, no, look, I, I totally agree. The, you know, the lightweightness of, of, of timber um, and mass timber in particular, when you compare it to concrete and doing these vertical extensions, it really makes people think a bit differently about how they develop their site. Um, and the ability to be able to get either maybe extra levels or, or not require strengthening to the existing building, um, it's, it's really important. But I think Julian made another good point about sharing of intellectual property. It's been something that's existed not only here in Australia but throughout the world when it comes to, to mass timber and probably other forms of innovation that um, everyone's been very secretive with their intellectual property and I can understand why it does cost a lot of money and 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 people you know like the land leases um you know, strong build down in down in up in Sydney um Atelier um down here in Melbourne as well as all the suppliers that you know it takes it takes a, a big step to 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 be a pioneer and to, to step into this space because there is high risk and you want to get the benefits out of that and um I, I totally get that and and but it's really important that this to really capitalise on this opportunity throughout the industry, we need to share our IP, mm -hmm. and it's starting to happen um, with all the suppliers, and, and we're really trying to break down those walls and barriers and share that information um, with, with consultants and um, with our contractors and, and the industry in general, just to make sure that um, the more buildings that are going up, um, the easier it becomes for everyone, um, rather than us fighting over a small piece of pie, let's just grow the pie, make it bigger. Um, I think this just makes it makes sense, and and what's encouraging is that the it's starting to you're seeing the table starting to turn, and um, the industry um, is really starting to, to take this on. Um, we've got projects happening, a lot of projects happening down here in in Victoria uh, that that aren't being built by uh, either Len Lease or, or, or Atelia. Multi Multiplex are doing a fair bit of work in in mass timber, and um, there's talk of some other projects that other builders are, are, are dabbling in. Um, which is fantastic, and, and yes, they're competition to, to our organisation at Atelier, but um, the more mass timber projects that start going up, the, the more comfortable the entire industry is, including, including developers and our clients, um, that we don't have to answer the same question over and over again, that, that it's risky or it can't be done or it's too hard, um, that, that it really starts becoming the norm. I, th I think Nathan may want to comment on this in more detail, but, but I think the other thing we're seeing, particularly in the US, is the use and development of hybrid structures. So doing things like using steel steel columns with CLT floors, for example, and um, I, I think that'll be the next, the next step for the industry in Australia is looking at these combined hybrid technologies and saying, well, actually, we can, we can go higher, we can go... Um, we can go faster, and the the sort of sustainability benefits are still still significant, um, and then also the aesthetic benefits. So I think we're we'll see we're seeing more of that in the US, and I can see that being the next wave of exploration and and construction in Australia. Yeah, um, personally, and uh, I'm well, Viztech, we're certainly not purist when it comes to timber. I mean, it's the right material for the right 
application. So hybrid structures are really the only way forward. Um, we're not going to see, uh, well, we can look into post-tensioning, things like this, but you've got to use other materials to, to help um, uh, essentially design a building in an efficient way. To, to either reach new heights or explore bigger spans, all of these different things. Yeah, I think hybridisation is the only way yeah, forward. And, and from my perspective too, coming from um, previous timber suppliers, that you've always got your timber hat on and, and you want to just push timber, um, to now being at, at Atelier and looking for the most efficient way to build a building um, really it's quite refreshing now to be able to look at a, a project and say, well, hang on a minute, maybe maybe a hybrid solution is the best or maybe a timber option isn't the best solution for a job and, and, and be able to look at the, the best possible um, architectural, structural and, and, and construction solution um, fit the purpose for that project and the client's needs. So um, I agree with, with Julian and, um, and Nathan's comments that you know, the hy hybrid construction um, is definitely the way of the future and I think that um, it's always existed um, but timber takes it to another level it just increases the depth of that matrix and um, allows allows builders and designers to to find um, a, a greater suite of um, solutions to build their buildings yeah and I think there'll be more efficiency once we start to really get into the ECI as well because at the moment we're constrained generally by architectural layouts that aren't really designed uh, with a certain material in mind so it's very restrictive and that causes a lot of complications with actually finding a, an appropriate solution material wise yeah and and again uh, being in this space for five or six years you, you, I've constantly dealt with projects that have been designed in concrete and trying to fit and squeeze and jam a, a timber solution into it. Um, what's really encouraging now is where there's a lot of jobs coming through that are actually being considered and, and, and architecturally designed and laid out to be efficient in timber. And, and the benefit of that to the designers, um, builders, as well as clients is that it actually is efficient in concrete too. Like you can still build it out of concrete and it won't be more expensive, but what you're actually doing now is you, you're designing a layout that's more flexible that the client can get actually prices for a steel, concrete and timber solution. Now, what, what is the most efficient for that particular job at that particular time? Okay, just so right now as we approach the end and wrap it up, could we all just go around and just talk about one of the big learnings that you're going to take away from being a part of 55 South Bank Boulevard? Yeah, if I start, look, I think... For us, it's really been in a position now where I'd say we've sort of reached a critical mass. We know at Bates Smart enough about timber buildings to say to a client, um, have you considered timber as a solution and this is what it might look like and this is what it might mean for you and we know who in the industry can help you um, realise this vision. So I think it's just this comf comfort that, um, as, as Nathan and Rob have been talking about, that timber isn't the ideal solution but we I think we now know when when we can use timber so I think that's very exciting for us and it's it's led us to introduce clients to projects um, using timber that they would not otherwise have, have contemplated and uh, there's a couple that we're doing now that wouldn't have happened done you know without the knowledge that we'd gained on 55 South Bank Boulevard in our office building in 25 King Street so that that feels like a big contribution that we're making at Bates Smart because we know that um, putting a sustainability hat on that the construction industry contributes to a sort of somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the world's carbon emissions and you say these buildings are amazing because the timber for example in um, in 55 South Bank Boulevard sequestering about five and a half thousand tonnes of um, carbon dioxide so you say actually we're making a real contribution that 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 aspect of the building is not carbon neutral, it's carbon negative. Um, so that's, that's the thing that excites us. And then being at the forefront of, of pushing that technology and actually contributing to shaping those outcomes with the client rather than you know, the traditional architect-client relationship where a client will come and develop a brief with us. So I think we're, we're pretty excited by that, that, that aspect of the, um, of the project and, and, and timber. Yeah, look, um, from my perspective, the, the, the devil's in the detail and, and um, 
I've been working in this space for a while now, but when you when you actually need to start delivering projects from a builder's perspective, um, everything comes to the surface. You need to resolve everything. In construction, you just can't sweep things under the carpet. Um, so for me, the biggest learning um, on this is, is the details and what needs to be resolved, what needs to be discussed, and at what point during the design process, the procurement process, um, letting of subcontracts or suppliers, those decisions need to be made and the support that we need from consultants as well as subcontractors. So that's been the biggest learning curve. Um, and look, there's there's plenty of solutions out there in the market and I think this is where a lot of the IP discussion comes in to, to really work out how you manage those. So um, for anyone out there who's, who's looking to build a um, a, a, a CLT or mass timber structure. Um, look, it's definitely achievable. It's, there's so many solutions out there. Um, but the word of advice is to really to start digging deep into the details as early as you possibly can to, to bring them out to the surface so you can generate the best solution for the project. Yeah, uh, mine's quite similar to Rob's, but uh, essentially coordination between everyone is really important, uh, particularly in the modelling stage. So you've got CLT, uh, shop drawings happening, steel core shop drawings and coordinating those along with the connection details to make sure that it's actually going to uh, go together correctly but also behave as, as designed. I think that's crucial. If you haven't been there already, I recommend that you go and check out the Wood Solutions website. It is the most visited website in the world on wood with over 4,000 pages of content. So if you've got questions or if you just want to upskill, then that is the place to go.